What is up, everybody? I am Jason Tros, the host of Business of Betting Podcast. I'm really excited to have Alex Kane join us today from Sport Trade. Um, I'm, I'm excited for a few reasons. One, he's uh, an entrepreneur in a space that's very near and dear, close to mine, exchange spaces. And two, he's a pioneer bringing the exchange uh, to the US market. And I'm really curious um, how it's been going. So, Alex, thanks you very much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. So, why don't we kick off by you explaining where you got the passion and the energy to start a business in the space? Like, what's the founding story of uh, Sport Trade? Uh, the, the founding story is I, I went to uh, Drexel University, which is a school in Philadelphia. And I don't remember the exact moment, but I just remember everyone was talking about Robinhood. And that was back before their like rebrand. So it wasn't like the lime green, it was very much like the bright bluish green. Um, and the kind of the burnt crimson orange uh, red for for down um, was there like the market is down color. And I just remember like everyone in the finance school, like talking about it and, you know, college kids can tend to be early adopters. And I just I th th they were still running the commercials those days of like Schwab is down to ten dollars a trade and e trade is down to seven dollars a trade. And this, of course, was free and it was a mobile app and it made sense and you could sign up digitally. And I just thought to myself, like yeah, this is going to be, you know, this is really going to be something. And I wasn't much of a sports better. And at some point I, I kind of got interested in sports betting. And I just thought to myself, like, it's inevitable. Like someone's going to create an app that kind of can combine like the control and um, ease of use that Robinhood gives you uh, with, with sports betting, because as, as you have been such a preacher of and supportive of for, for many years, like there's just not that much of a difference you know, it's an event contract. So, mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the, the thinking and the thought process. And then I had to, from there, like I had no idea how to build an exchange. I had no idea what a market maker was. I had, I, I was like, all right, I'm going to go build this thing. And then I'm like, oh crap, like how does, the, how does the NASDAQ work? Like, how do you, how, how are the prices changing so quickly? And I went on this journey to kind of build sport trade. So what did you study at Drexel? I studied business law and finance. Okay. And did you have other jobs um, after graduation or did you jump straight into this? So my job during school was I was like a paralegal intern at a law office. Um, Drexel has like a co-op program. Um, so it's on like the quarter system and not the semester system. So half the year you're, you're, you're in a job. And I was working in an immigration law office and I, I enjoyed it. But <laughs> the person that was the boss basically said, if you want to make a lot of money, go into finance. Like that's what Finance means money type thing. It's that simple. And so I switched over into finance and I, I still kind of kept my job as a paralegal intern. Um, and, and then in 2017, I graduated. And then like very late in 2017, I kind of embarked on trying to build Sport Trade, which was the preemption of a ton of ups and downs as an entrepreneur, as I'm sure you can uh, empathize, empathize for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think Elon Musk said it's like chewing glass. So it's there's, there's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of... Uh, heartache that goes into it. So, um, so when I started my journey, I said computer science and I was a stock trader. So I had a little bit of experience in exchanges and technology. Um, but you not coming from a sports betting background or not necessarily a finance background, what did you do to kind of, uh, in the UK language, you'd say swat yourself up? Like, what did you do to, um, get up to speed? So I quickly began probably in early 2018 working with um, someone that was a friend of a friend who was technical. And we sat there, you know, he worked at Capital One and I would try to be raising money during the day. Then at night, like I would go over to his house or we join up virtually and we were like, OK, like if you go on to like Binance.com, there's like a, a wall on the left that looks like all the like the buyers. And then there's a wall on the right. All right, we need to build like our, and we called it like a buy wall and a sell wall, like not even an order book. We had no idea what an order book was. And then we're like, okay, well, like it would make sense that if like, if you want to buy something at a fixed price and you want to match these buyers and sellers together, it has to be like one in, one out. It has to be first, first in, first out rather. So we built like, ended up building like a FIFO price time uh, central limit order book. And like, you know, within a year we built like a mobile app and we were trying to get people to use it. And 
you know, by 2019, we had, you know, a refurbished version of a mobile app and like it worked. It was like, we built like a pretty cool risk algorithm of like, well, if you, if you're short a bunch of outcomes in a related market, like a, who's going to win the NBA championship, you know, you can credit back like the, the, the credit of each short position. And like, it was pretty good, but it was like cloud-based and it wasn't super, uh, you know, regulated or anything like that. And it was, it was totally free to play. So we kind of just learned by doing, I had, we didn't take any packages or libraries for the internet. We literally built the whole thing from scratch. And like, that was a really cool way, I think, of like learning about market microstructure. And like, oh man, what if, what happens if someone has like a speed advantage? Like what should the exchange do to price the trade? Like, I don't know, we just nerded out about it for like a year, year and a half until we got to like a really working demo. And that was what allowed us to raise some money and get into tech stars and kind of put the next foot in front of the other. So this year, year and a half, did you have day jobs or were you full time on this? Uh, so I was full time on it. And the individual I was with, his name was Greg. Um, he joined full time in like November of 2018. So I thought it was like okay. such a cool moment. I was like, wow, I got someone to like quit their real job um, <laughs> and try this. A, like, you know, it is a big moment. OK. And so. All right. So you you founded this by yourself in 2017. Mm-hmm. And um, and then when did you raise your first money? Um, so that wasn't, so we raised some money in 2018 and it was like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate from where I come from, but I don't know anyone that like can give me a hundred thousand dollars type thing, but I do know someone that can give me 5,000. Right. So we kind of did like a family friend, friend of friends type thing and, and uh-huh. cobbled together probably 50 to a hundred thousand. Um, which was, which was seemed like a billion dollars to me at the time. Um, and then we raised about like a total of about a half million um, going into the Techstars program because they, they Comcast and Techstars put in, um, I think, between 100 and 150,000. And we used that to kind of create some momentum. And then like by mid to end of 2019 is when I started to learn like, oh, I'm not going to raise any money from a traditional investor. I mean, sports betting really hadn't picked up to like this, the excitement of around the TAM until like 2020, 2021. Mm. And uh, we pitched a lot of great VCs and they were like, we don't know anything about sports betting, so we can't lead your round. So then I was like, ah, the only logical place to go is like Chicago, where every time I go to Chicago, like everybody loves this idea. So I, I just started flying there each weekend until we raised a round. Awesome. One of my funny stories from founding my business was I, I did a friends and family round and you know, got small checks like you did, and we raised a hundred thousand dollars. But the uh, the funny bit was, I knew nothing about how to structure the investment, and I ended up spending twenty five thousand of the hundred thousand on lawyers to to structure the deal, which was a which was a a, a funny mistake to make uh, in hindsight. Um, okay, cool. So when did when did you launch? You launched last September, right? September twenty mm-hmm. two. Yep. Okay, so take me from you know tech stars to to launch. What was that process like? Yeah, so by kind of the end of the tech stars program, I think we had heard a bunch of no's. You need to raise so much. You know, one of the things I think is so admirable about you and your business is like you got to do this the real way. You got to do it the way any entrepreneur builds a, a any technology business. You, you you raise as little as you possibly can, and you. You, you kind of burn both ends of the candle and you, you, you get a working demo and, and you, you, you know, your business obviously Uber regulated, but maybe not as maybe a slightly different way than in the U S where I, now, you know, you guys were the first one to launch a cloud-based matching engine, which I think is awesome. Um, and for us, like the startup costs were just so high. Like you, you, we couldn't raise $3 million and kind of de-risk one thing. Um, it was, it just required such a big upfront investment. We wanted to launch in New Jersey because even in 2019, like that was still one of the biggest and most de-risked states from like a, the TAM is there mm-hmm. perspective. Um, and so, you know, the founders that I had at that point and I picked up were like, you know, you know, we love you. We like this concept. We don't like, we're not willing, this is not a hill we're willing to die on type thing. Um, two smart people, which I'm still really close with now. Um, and they stepped away. So in, in 2020, I kind of had to start from scratch. Um, and, but fortunately by that time, I'd already been speaking with um, a certain market maker that was based in Chicago that was like really excited and wanted to do something really big in the U S. And I just think it was really lucky for me, right time, right place. And, you know, in, 
I think April of May of 2020 is when, um, you know, we signed a, a, I signed a term sheet for like a larger round of financing that allowed me to truly start like building a team and all the stuff I needed to do to, to try and ultimately launch in New Jersey. And it wasn't until later in 2020, but he, we probably had like six employees and a pitch deck and we got John Ross, who's a CTO of NASDAQ to like build our matching engine. And he was like front and center on the pitch deck, you know, um, to, to get a market access deal because we just had, we had no credibility whatsoever. So that was a fun time trying to, trying to get a market access deal in, in New Jersey. And uh, awesome. And, and the large financing, who did that come from? So this is a firm that um, ultimately has participated in, in a couple of our rounds. It's a firm called Delavan Lake. Um, and they are, they were the former, many of them, the former uh, team at Getco. Mm -hmm. And Getco was, as you know, very, very, very successful, disruptive, one of the first electronic market makers in Chicago, um, founded by um, Dan Tierney and Steven Schuler. Um, and so a couple of their first traders actually were sports betters and they got recruited into financial trading, but always wanted to do this for sports. And so we had this like, just from the moment of meeting those guys, we're like, oh, well, how do we make markets like when the ball's live? And how do we do this without like a six second delay for everybody? And how do we, like, we just nerded out about like the things that like 100% did not matter at that point. But like, I could just tell like, oh, these guys are going to do something huge. I want to do something with them. And that's kind of how we started. Awesome. And so, so let's take a little bit of a detour on the technology side because that's mm -hmm. that's uh, very close to my interest. Um, mm -hmm. So we built everything ourselves, and I want to say largely uh, out of necessity and maybe naivete, not because we thought we could do better, but you know, I didn't even know if we could have gone someplace to get a matching engine. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I've learned is that I mean, we're still working on our matching engine. There's still you know, 15 years in, I can still tell you there's this feature, that feature, this thing. Mm -hmm. that we need to make better and better like how did you as a scrappy maybe underfunded or or new to the industry like what did you do for your matching engine you mentioned the cto from nasdaq mm -hmm. did you build it in-house did you outsource parts of it what did you guys do uh so we we built it in-house i this is probably now in this late spring early summer of 2020 and at this point it's it's myself it's avi who's now our chief product officer will is a vp of engineering um, Anthony, our CFO, I think we had just hired our first mobile developer. I mean, we were like, you know, we're like, oh, how do we build this like matching engine? Will was, Will's brilliant. Will's one of this, he's, I think he's a couple years younger than me. He's, he went to Berkeley. He's from the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. And like, it's like a goodwill hunting situation. No pun intended. Like he just gets market microstructure. He worked at Broad Ridge. He looked at the matching engine we built that was cloud-based and basically said, like, he, it was incredible. Um, but he wasn't going to build a matching engine because we needed to build, he wanted to build a broker backend because that, that ultimately ended up being the way bigger project. Um, and, and so we're looking around and, like, I'm reading about Island, as you probably know, like, iNet became, Island became iNet. But Island was, like, this infrastructure, this thought process on how to build a matching engine. Um, and, and some of the people that worked at Island, like Brian Nagito, um, John Ross is one of them went on to like incredible careers. And so I started reading about John Ross and then our investor was like, I think we have someone that could help us build the matching engine. It's John Ross. And like, I like just fell out of my chair, you know, and I talked to him and we're like, ah, should we like buy it? We could buy it from NASDAQ. There's some other things we could, he's like, no, no, no. Like I'll, I'll build it for you type thing. So we brought him on, which is a purely equity based deal. And he wrote Island again. And he was like, look, this is, this is NASDAQ 2012 level. You'll never need anything more. This is this thing can do, you know, if you put some solar flare cards in there, you can do a million messages a second. Like you're never going to need that. And he told me from the very beginning, he's like, this is not going to be your challenge. Your challenge is going to be all the pre and post trade stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. This is going to be the big challenge. And, and we did it. And he wrote it in about eight months. And it's, you know, it's purely, it was initially purely price time. We built some other kind of cool stuff on the side that, We've started to launch since, and uh, it's a cloud. It's a on the ground. It's completely, which is what John's expertise was, and we built it. And uh, that was that was done probably twelve months before we were able to launch. Maybe more. 
like it ended up being like our big challenge was everything else. So we got really lucky hiring John and like, he just has seen it all. Like he's built, he's built a ton of matching engines um, before and he's worked on a ton of pro projects. I think he spent like 20 years or two years of his life building a microwave tower between like Frankfurt and London. So he was like, you don't want to ever turn this into a speed race. So here's how you're going to fix that. And like, you just had all this vision and I would just sit there and listen to him and Will go back and forth and just be amazed that Will at the age of like 25 at the time, like knew what he was talking about, that he was on his level. And like, John's the type of guy, like one of the kindest, smartest, most respectful people that never tells you that you're wrong, always listens to your viewpoint. And so we spent that 2020 and early 2021 kind of building, building the matching engine. Wow, that's uh, that's a cool story. I didn't know that story. Um, cool. So you said that that was one of the easier things to solve, and that the mm -hmm. you would the pre and post trade would become difficult. What what were those challenges? I think uh, U.S. is interesting because like there's some things you have to do on the ground, and there's some things that like are back office you can do in the cloud, and it depends per state on what that is. Um, I, I think we had figured out like a good deal of our like market microstructure and stuff. Uh, but we had never built like, uh, I guess the only applicable like thing with like a full stack futures exchange where you're the FCM as well. Like you're the, you're the broker. And so, you know, what to do when a game gets voided and, uh, you know, how to, how to create like a queuing mechanism for like, okay, someone requested the deposit or withdrawal and an order was requested at the same time. So building like some sort of queuing mechanism that can do that. Um, and that ended up being like, we had to figure out like, oh crap, well, the regulator is going to need some backdoor into this. Also, if we need a thing that we can go in and we can add an activity ledger, call an activity ledger, that we, we can add an object that like increments and decrements balance and like Oh, responsible gaming. Like it probably took us six months to build all that for the U S of like, we thought we could do the time limit and session limit a certain way. Oh no, we have to do it a different way. What to, happens if the app goes in the background? And I think we were, I think we were really hard on ourselves and try to do everything exactly the way that the regulator wanted. And then I think now we open up all these other apps and we're like, wait a minute, they're breaking the rules, but I, you know, we, you learn, you live and you learn, you know? So that's kind of mm. what took a, a while. As somebody that's been in both markets, I've been incredibly frustrated by a lot of the, there's a lot of ticky tacky rules in the U S that are very poorly designed. And you know, the, the, a lot of the sports betting laws of are sort of legacy from the terrestrial casino industry. And I, I found a lot of that stuff very ridiculous and unnecessary. And so I sympathize. Um, you know, one of the things that we had to go through, which I found quite painful, was like GLI 33 certification. Does New Jersey have GLI 33? Uh, we're doing that now, but we they have they actually have their own performance lab. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, so I, I said they're, they are absolutely fantastic. Like we we took to them this like totally new concept. I think there's an even newer concept out there, Mojo, which is not maybe been done before. It sounds kind of new, but, but like, I don't know. They like adopted it pretty quickly. They're like, ah, oh, you know what? This portfolio page is pretty cool, you know? And so you just, we just try to work every possible angle to try to get them comfortable with this new model and getting comfortable with the market maker, right? Like they allow exchanges. Okay. Well then you must allow market makers because market makers are critical to exchanges as I, as I had learned, um, kind of working through all those, all those issues. So, like the founding story, I think is interesting because it kind of like for me, my founding story colors how I run the business from your founding story. Um, you said you're really quite excited about the concept of Robin hood and you know, the fact that people are trading stocks and in, in a very new way, why wouldn't people do that with sports? How did you think about the competition? How did you think about the other existing exchanges and the other sports books? Like what was your, what was the thing that you wanted to be different about in the industry? Um, I think the thing we wanted to be different about, and I think it's definitely a, a big vision, the long-term vision, um, is I think that if you, I think, I think actual value does not matter to 
recreational people, not even in sports betting, anything. Um, perceived value, as on the other hand, is incredibly powerful. So I, I watch my dad and he's like, I do this same like, same game parlay because I get a 10% boost for every one. Like he thinks he's putting 10% in his pocket, each one. It's such a brilliant thing because he's getting perceived value. Um, of course he's not, you know, but, but the, you're, you're, you're part of the vast minority. You know, if you, if, if you, you are like me or like you and you're have unabated open or odds checker and you're like, how is not anyone, how is everyone not using SPK right now? How is it in t- the entire UK not using this? Like this is the better price. You've even gone as far as showing the person on the app, the price is better. And it's just like, I think that's really, really hard. And I think it's it's part of what we wanted to do. But one of the reasons we came up with a new kind of price convention is like, well, maybe like what if we could create like perceived value or just an entirely new activity and, and be unique in that way? Because then we don't really have to bank on the fact that like minus 135 is way better than minus 150, which is what everyone else has on this given game. Um, and so And so that's the way we want to be different. We want to try and teach people this idea of like, Share price equals probability, and you can kind of buy and sell throughout the game. And it's certainly an education curve to do that. Um, we do way better with the people that like, oh, yeah, yeah, I use Robinhood. This is amazing. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of energy. Um, but I think it's, it, it will, it's what will make us like different. And I think you, you would agree your app is different. It has to be different in order to kind of be able to carve out like defendable market share. Mm-hmm. So how is, uh, talk me through, you launched in September 2022, and, and I know from experience, these things take a while to kind of get going, but talk to me about how, how things have been going in the market. Um, really good. I have been surprised on how much some people trade. Um, and I think one of our, like, we really tried to solve the chicken or egg problem with like this very institutional view on a sports betting exchange, which I think we're in the process of like softening up a bit. Like I'll give you an example. Like our exchange opens at 9 a.m. each morning. And so like there's like 20 people between us and the market maker that like get on the starting line and like within five seconds, every market is fully quoted. You can get 5,000 plus down on anything. If there isn't like siren bells go off, it's kind of like designed like the NASDAQ open. Like you, an incident starts, right? If the market isn't quoted. And I think, I think I'm realizing, ah, we could probably open earlier or get to something like 23.7 and it's okay if people see an empty market. But, I, but the flip side of that is it's helped us with like, we haven't had to teach people how to like do a limit order and then like match people together. The vast, vast majority of our trades are like, you know, facilitated by the market maker. Um, and so that's allowed us, like if someone does want to do $15,000 down, like they can. Um, which we, which we think is really great and kind of why we put so many chips in like the building this, you know, you know, with, with a market maker as a, as a key part of our like value prop for the customer in mind. Um, but yeah, so that's been surprising. And then like, yeah, there's definitely an education curve. So we're doing a lot now after we learned in the next first, like two, three, four months of like, you know what, this requires some like hands-on. So I spend a lot of my time like just texting customers, calling customers, doing demos, trying to do anything to get someone to that like aha moment because the like the engagement, like once you place like one trade, five trade, 10 trades is like the magic number. It's, mm-hmm. it's amazing. It is really, really cool. And I'm sure your business is the same. Like once someone gets you're like, oh, I can back here, lay here, take that money, go to this market, you know, and they just love it. Mm-hmm. And can you talk to me about who your market makers are and, and what role they play? Yes. So our, our primary market maker is that first funder of our business, um, Dell Van Lake Trading. There's a, a press release out there from Jan, Ju, July of 21 um, where they're, they're mentioned. And um, yep, they sit about 25 feet away from their order entry port um, in, in Atlantic City. And uh, they send send messages from there to the matching engine to cancel and, and submit orders. And they have a duty. They've signed an agreement with us that's like um, they have to be in these markets at this time with this depth and this width and so on and so forth. And uh, I've like they're insane. 
like what they're doing, I think for us sports is like, it's never been done. Um, the, 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 the prices are so tight. We have no delays at, at all in play. There are times where they're of half dollar wide, a dollar wide in play. You could rip 2000. They'll be back in 10 milliseconds, another 2000. Like they are, they're here to try and take this, you know, drive, put it in overdrive type thing. Um, and they have, you know, investors uh, that also were, were doing this in, in the financial markets and kind of believe in their vision. Um, and so that is by far like the best part about sport trade that when I text customers are like, this is insane. Like, I love doing live arbing with you guys because I'll hit you guys second because I know that if I can get the past the seven second delay on Caesars, it's a green flag for you guys. Um, and so we like oh, the overwhelming amount of our volume is in play because pregame is just not that not that interesting or fun. Not that the prices aren't great, they are. But once you get in play, it's like you could you could rip a trade and then like four seconds later you could actually be up and get out, mm-hmm. which which I think is really cool. And do you have other market makers that are also participating or just, just the one? Um, just one is a, a primary market maker. Um, you know, our, we, I think we maybe have a different, like, we, I think Sportrade took a different sort of take, which is like, we want to contractually bring on a market maker to like, I'm not sure like how your business works, but like they have to, like, we have to be certain that if we're going to list this product, they're going to support the product. So it's kind of like, well, we're not listing it until you support it. Because if we put it out there, there may be two people in our whole environment that are willing to put a a limit order out there. And they're smart enough to know that like, well, maybe I don't want the limit order out there when the game starts type thing. Got it. Um, So if, if, if there's other market makers out there that will enter into a contractual relationship, you're open for that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, talk to me a little bit about your business model. How do you guys make money? So we charge, um, it, it's actually slightly different than markets. You guys charge 2% net win on the market, right? Mm-hmm. So we charge 2% net win on any, any time you incur a profit. So it's actually a bit higher of a commission because you could buy in at 60 bucks a share and sell at 80. You, pay, you make 20, we take 2%. And then you could buy back in later that same outcome or same outcome in a different market in the same market, different outcome in the same market. And you may lose and then you go and do it again and then you may win. So it's like each discrete point, you're taking an action. You're either adding risk, in which case there's no P&L happening, or you're reducing risk in the form of like exiting a position or a position settles. And at that moment in time, if there's profit, we take 2% of it. If there's not, we don't. What if they? What if you buy? I don't know, ten dollars, and you sell five dollars. That five dollars isn't closed out. Do you? How do you calculate the? So you're basically saying if you do a buy sell pair, you mm-hmm. pay two percent on that, right? Mm-hmm. And what if you don't even out the buy sell pair, or does your interface enforce that you have to close out the first trade before you do a third trade? You you. Uh, so in in your language, like you're you're actually buying and selling. I'm sure your matching actually works the same way, but like you're buying and selling in potential return. So yeah. like you're buying one share is $100 of potential return. You could yeah. buy $10 worth of something and then turn around and now it's worth $12 and you go and you sell $5 worth of the 12. But on that part of that trade, you incurred some sort of profit because you bought a quarter of a share then you sold a 10th of a share. So on that 10th of a share, you incurred some amount of profit and we take 2% of that. But then, yeah, okay. you're left with some, you know, you're still open, you're still long your original position, you're just a little bit less long. If that settles for a loss, let's say you pay zero. And what happens if you uh, close out a trade before the match is over at a loss? Does that loss carry forward on the, no. So, okay. Yeah, Got no it. Concept it of a carry forward. And, uh, you know, I, if it's confidential, that's no problem. But do you have a what's the kind of financial arrangement you have with the market makers? Do you do a profit share with them, or do they pay you a commission? How do you how do you handle that? Uh, we share revenue. Okay, hmm. um, got it. And so, what what are the big challenges for you now? Is it customer acquisition? Is customer it acquisition. more? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Customer acquisition. So, so New Jersey, there's what, 19, 20 other competitors in the market? Is that right? Something like that? Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's, I think there's more. There's like 25. And there's another exchange called Profit. There's Mojo. Mm-hmm. There's, and there's like, yeah, probably 25 sports books. So what, are, what channels are you using for, for customer acquisition? So the channels that work right now are like all the price shopping sites where someone will come in. Like we didn't have American odds initially and that was a mistake. And we added that. And I think that's helped a ton because people, one of the use cases is like, there's definitely a customer out there that says like, I don't care how easy this interface is. I don't care that it looks sleek. I don't care that you're using zero to hundred. Like you have the best price. You have no delays. You have instant rebets. Like it could be like unicorns and daisies, right? And they would love it. Um, and then there's the type of customer that does care about those things. And some of those customers we initially kind of went over on like the price. They start like getting their feet wet of like taking a short position, the futures outcome, or like just taking a flyer of like, I'm going to buy the Bruins to win the NHL playoffs now and I'm not hedging it. And I think it's going to go up and I'll sell it. So they're kind of like starting to really uh, understand like the power of this, which is great. And so one of our best channels, yeah, is like, Unabated, Odds Jam, Dark Horse, Spank Odds, like all of the um, price sensitive shops out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think digital like packs a pretty good punch. Like what we do on paid social and search um, mm-hmm. brings a lot of downloads. And uh, it, we, we're, we're trying to figure out like, you know, what's the best way to actually convert a user when they land on the app. And so we're like in the process of like putting together some like incredibly out of the box ideas into how to do that because you you land on sport trade and like you see any other sports book and like there's promos and like you know, any of these things and you land on sport trade is very different and we're trying to kind of bridge that gap and we've started to make a lot of changes in the last like month that have been like really awesome because customers are like oh yeah okay you do have a promo okay amazing amazing oh yeah wait how does this work again and like they can actually text us so if you sign up for sport trade you get a text within 15 minutes sometimes it's me Sometimes it's somebody else and like, we'll sit down with you and do a demo and get you onboarded. Cause we know that it's like such a good investment for us because then like, you're going to tell your friends about it. Oh, we have a referral friend program and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. How do you compare yourself to profit? I think it's um, like, I think objectively speaking a profit it does, it looks a bit more like Betfair. Um, I think the pregame liquidity is pretty good. I think the big difference is like, it's, it's uh it's zero, like everything clears out for in play. Mm-hmm. And for us, it's like, that's when it really gets incredible. And so, yeah, close to 60% of our volume is, is in play. Um, and so I think that's the, the big, big difference um, is, is you can, you can get in and out. I think the last time I checked out profit, like if each time you place a bet, they hold the whole principle of that bet, even if it's netting risk against like, so that your $5, $10 example, they would hold out all 15. Mm-hmm. I guess if you're laying five, you may be like the, the liability of that lay may be $26. So they're going to hold out 26 plus 10, 36. And for us, it's like, we give it right back to you. We give you your principal and your profit minus the commission back in your pocket. Got it. Okay. So let, let's say I was playing the role of investor and you're coming to me for your next round of financing. And I would, if I were to say, you know, there's 25 competitors, like you've gotten a little bit of, like, why are you going to, why is sport trade going to make it? Like what, what, why should I back you? Like, what would you say to that? I think it'd be pretty simple. I'd say, um, when we get to customer to, to use this and understand it, they absolutely love it. And we don't have to get to, we're so small right now. We don't have to get to 25,000 users in three months um and when we when we acquire a customer that like gets to that aha moment and like we're getting that down to like the first 15 minutes of signing up um they become you know an ambassador for our business they become our fur friend program is getting more and more popular because people are like you know what i didn't know what this was i signed up for it i still didn't know what it was and then like alex texted me or anthony or david or arpita or one of the other people that will reach out to you and like, I get it. And it's amazing. And you can actually watch a game and you can like, like no other sports book has this, like you get, you bet on any other sports club 
and like there's a six second delay. So like you missed it. Like the play happened. Shit, the odds moved. Sport traded is like, all right, buy in forty dollars a share. I'm in ten shares, and then like you see the three pointer, right? Assuming your feed is somewhat on time, or even you don't, and like your thing sh- turns green, and then you see the three pointer. Like, I'm up twenty percent right now, and then you sell, and it's instantaneous. Like, sport trade is the only only place that that is feasible or possible. And, 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 and therein is a totally new way to think about sports that if we can get people to adopt, and yes, that is the challenge, right? Getting people to adopt that. There's no one else that can do that. And so that's, that's the sport trade pitch. So you're saying you don't have any delay in any sport. Correct. So what do you do when it's the end of the game and somebody, you know, what do you do against court setting risk? How do you protect your market makers? Um, so eventually I think there will be court siders. Um, the data takes about two seconds, uh, one and a half to two seconds. I've gone to baseball games to try to court side. Like if you put the infrastructure together and you buy the, you know, the tickets and you get the great internet and you sit in the seats and it's probably possible, but we're so far ahead of that. We've already thought about what's going to happen when ultimately courtsiders try to aggress on sport trade. And Go we, on. We've, we've built. What would you do? Well, we've built uh, technology where our, our matching engine actually slips into a different m- matching methodology entirely uh, at discrete points when the matching engine notices a net order imbalance and then it snaps back into price time. And the advantage you mean it goes of this, to like pro rata or something else? Uh, it's, it's not pro rata. Think of it this way, like um, if you think like, okay, how could you solve the court cider problem? Well, why don't I just find the accounts that are doing it and limit them? Nope, that's not going to work because uh, someone's just going to get a losing account and crush you. Okay, that doesn't work. Well, okay, what if I could just limit every single bet amount at discrete points or during the game to $100? Oop, that doesn't work. Why? A great court cider will get 40 phones and you could have a really great profitable customer that likes to bet $2,000 at a time. The mm-hmm. only way to do it is to have the matching engine be the sole source of sensing and feeling net order imbalance. And at that, those discrete points switch into entirely different met- matching method- methodology and then go back into price time. That way, if you're a court sider, in the aggregate, not just one account, in the aggregate, you need to bet a lot. That is the only fact about court siding. Nobody is going to spend all this time, energy, and money to only bet $100 a time court siding. You just never make enough to make up the investment that ultimately is incurred by doing court siding. And so we have this like in- incredibly amazing technology that actually John helped come up with, which I think is going to change sports betting forever, um, that, that, that gives the smaller customer, the customer that doesn't, that's watching like me on a two minute delay on Hulu, like why would you ever give me a five second delay? DraftKings for me is 10 seconds. I'm like, I've got to be three minutes behind by the time this, because it's a very brute force, heavy handed. I need to protect against court siding and screw the 99.9% of the audience that, that, uh, that's gaming, that's not gaming the system. Our system flips that entirely on its head and basically says, well, we're only going to go after the 0.1% of the audience. That's, you know, and you can, you have some big customers that will get caught in this, that will, will trigger a delay and things like that. But I think it's it's a system, as you may know. Um, you know, some of it works in financial markets. Nasdaq Nordic does it. Uh, Bats, um, which is now You're talking about like a last look kind of mechanism. It's not like last look. It's it's uh, it's it's a totally different price time. It's not price time. So uh-huh. like basically, orders start to come in, and you're like, all right, we're not doing price time. We've sensed a net order imbalance. Like and the matching engine does some magic. And then it clears out everything. And then it's like, all right, we're back into price time. Oh, shit, we're not back into price time. Something just happened. Oh, we're back into price time. And it's not based on the feed because feed's too slow. It is based on the only true source of truth. This is what makes match, exchange is so amazing. Mm-hmm. Data of orders coming in. Matching engine sees it all in real time at the same time over multicast. Like it's within microseconds that we would see orders come in. And at that moment in time, like this, the, the court side is going to self-identify themselves and they don't even know what's about to happen. And I think, yeah, that's the exciting thing about sport trade is like we could do all this stuff, but that's not the pitch because mm-hmm. we need to get there first. Like <laughs> we need to get to the point where we're matching million dollars a game and 
millions of dollars a game and, and people are like, oh, I'm going to go game sport trade. And it's like, oh, the, the party's just going to get started when that happens. Like, <laughs> that, that's, what's, that's what I'm so excited about. And right now, when you ask, like, what is a challenge of sport trade? None of that matters. Like, the only thing that matters right now is, like, we need to get customers. And, and, <laughs> you'll and you'll say that, but as you get bigger, you attract these uh... – uh, these, I don't know what you would call them, but there's like toxic customers that just sit there and, and wait for the exchange to make mistakes. Like they are That's quite right. frustrating to deal with and, and do ruin the experience for everybody. So it sounds like you have a little bit of a magic algorithm that might solve for it. Maybe. But, uh, but my, my, uh, old man advice to you is like, it will become a bigger and bigger problem as, as you do get bigger because the, the, you'll have a, there's some kind of incentive for these toxic customers to find you faster than a retail customer can find you. Yes. So yeah. there's, you will attract these people disproportionately to, to retail customers. Yeah. And I'm you sure get. you get the problem like yeah, where then they say, well, like, well, Smarkets is banning a winner and smart, like, and on Twitter, there's no nuance. So it's really tricky. And I kind of sympathize because yeah. I kind of see it happening and I'm like, well, they just don't understand market micro structure. They don't understand that if a market maker feels they're going to get picked off every so odd minute, they're not going to do it. And they don't do it. You know, markets, you know, markets, you know, the business, like they don't, they don't understand that. So it, and it's yeah. really tough because you, you can't sit there and lecture on Twitter because then like the whole mob comes after you. So I'm sure it's, I, I probably don't even understand how hard it is, but I can at least understand like maybe somewhat how hard it is. And I totally agree with you on the delay. Like the delay is such a shitty user experience. Um, we have no delay in football, uh, soccer rather. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, we're the only one that doesn't have a delay in soccer. But as for as much as it, it creates a nicer user experience, but it also creates other problems. Like uh, the way we handle it is if a goal is scored, we come yes. back and void your trade. You know, basically, if you are court siding and you you place a bet two seconds before a goal is scored, even if it was a good faith bet, we'll come back and void your bet. Mm -hmm. um, that's so even match thing, right? Yeah, that's the instant match thing. I think so it's a really even cool idea. It's uh, it's it's. I think it's slightly better than a seven ten second delay, but it's like it does have its own challenges and and trying to solve for that real time aspect of making the retail better happy and not opening yourself up too much to people who are just there to make your life hard is a very difficult problem. Yeah, you know it's interesting. The the we've I think as 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 early as fifteen years ago, like we as humans for anything that's like semi liquid. We've like we've reached the end of life for price time, like a serialized matching engine. Like th there's just so much data asymmetry, and by m the technology gets better and better. The 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 the, the millisecond used to matter, now the microsecond, now the nanosecond. You're always, always, always now going to have a participant that's faster than others. Like mm -hmm. so, I read these papers, I nerd out about this stuff. Like they measured. In, in on the London Stock Exchange, like there's a race, so there's a stale order, there's a race between two or more participants. The average time delta between the fastest participant and the second fastest participant is 25 millionths of a second. There's no social utility of that. And I always said, I think you agree, like sports betting is financial markets in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and so I don't think that price time in anything is going to end up being the optimal way to do it. I think that you have to realize that, like, okay, if I have one court cider, I likely have two court ciders. Let us let those court ciders compete against each other. Like, don't create this like speed race because they're always just going to one up each other. And the loser is going to be the exchange, and the loser is going to be the market maker, and the loser is going to be the the retail customer. It's a totally, totally zero sum game. So, so yeah, I, I think I could nerd out about this for hours. I just think like price time, even in the U.S. stock market, it's it's going to be over. They're going to go to batch auctions, 50, 50 millisecond batch auctions. And no mm -hmm. one's going to know the difference. And the mm -hmm. two bad, you know, market takers out there are going to go out of business and the execution quality is going to get way better for everybody else. That's probably my yeah. most controversial statement because I know there's some market makers out there that probably disagree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. I think that the millisecond, sub millisecond uh, pricing advantage is, 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 is silly as well. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the rest of the industry? Do you have an opinion on traditional sports books or the FanDuel, DraftKings, Duopoly or regulation? Um, any, any opinions that stick out for you? Uh, I, I like listening to your pods because you, uh, it's great. 
you ask a question, but then you're like, you'll insert the, like the casino stuff. And I totally agree. I think that like Blockbuster didn't like sell market access to Netflix. Right. Um, I think it's incredibly terrible and it's like really sad. That's how laws came to be. And like, we we do some work. We did, did work in Ohio. Uh, we're doing work in Illinois right now. Maybe we could partner up. We have an exchange wagering bill out there. It's totally freestanding. Um, that we're working on. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, it, it plays to the advantage of the casino, but you know the, the price of market access is plummeting right now. I think I yeah. think in two years the minimum revenue guarantee is not going to be exist. I think you'll have to pay an operator to enter Indiana. It would not it'd be a fool's errand to do so. And I do think, uh, yeah, the, the FanDuel DraftKings has such an advantage because they're constantly coming up with ways to build the facade of perceived value. And that's like you and I sit there like, well, the same game probably is not two-sided and it's a 29% hold. 99.9999% of people are like, it's 20% profit boost every time I add a leg. Are you crazy? Why wouldn't you do this? And and so the next frontier is going to be trying to, and I know I think you guys do this, like having parlays. I think it's going to be critical for platforms to meet the customer where they are and try and anticipate where the bookmaker is going next and build that advantage and perceived value. Um, Cause it just, it's, it just takes a long time to, to like educate the customer. And if you think about it, 95% of people are like, what am I in math class? Like, no, I'm having fun. I'm betting with my friends. I just want to have fun. Oh shit. Right, we got to make this thing more fun then. I think that's what you're doing with SBK. And like that social component is critical. Cause like that's perceived value. Oh, I can follow a tipster. I can bet on mm. it. I can bet against it. Like, no one else has that. Like, I think that's that's critical to start to kind of meet the customer where they are and not try to bring them in and be like, no, our pricing's better. Use this. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Alex. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I wish you the best of luck. Um, you know, I think exchanges should take over sports books at some point. So I'm I'm rooting for you, Profit, and the uh, other exchanges out there to uh, to kick some sports bet sports book. But so. thanks so much for your time. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.